So welcome to this webinar on five proven strategies to improve immunization that I use by PATH IDEA. IDEA is the Immunization Data Evidence for Action, IDEA. So the pres presentation will last about 30 minutes and the remaining time will be dedicated to questions and answers. Um, so if you have uh, any question, uh, you can use the Q&A uh, at the bottom right hand of your screen, you will see the Q&A box. Uh, you can ask your questions during the webinar and I'll gather them and the panelists will answer them after the presentation. You can also use the chat box to contact me privately in case you have some technical issues uh, during the, the, the presentation. I, I can help you. Uh, as I said, the presentation and the video will be made available on the TechNet uh, website early next week. We'll communicate through the forum and our social media channels. So today we have Laurie Werner and Alison Osterman from PATH. Uh, Laurie Werner is the Director of, of Program for PATH Center of Digital, Digital and Data Excellence and brings nearly 20 years experience of working across a spectrum of international development and global health efforts. She joined PATH in 2011 to support the decade of vaccines work and leads the BID Initiative portfolio work which focuses on improving immunization data collection, quality, and use for better decision-making in African countries. Laurie led the IDEA project, and she provides leadership for other efforts focused on individual-level health data and increasing data use. And Alison Osterman, our other panelist, is a program officer, and she has worked for, uh, with PATH since uh, 2016 with a focus on implementation, research, and evaluation on the health system analytics team. For the IDEA project, uh, Alison conducted the literature review and was the leading report writer. Alison has a master's in public health with a focus on health metrics and evaluation from the University of Washington. Laurie, Alison, uh, um, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks so much, um, Alex, and thanks everyone for joining. Um, this is Lori Werner, and I'm going to go ahead and start us off. And yes, Alison is driving the slides. Um, sorry for being a couple of minutes late technical difficulties. Uh, so yes, as Alex mentioned, we're going to share with you today um, a body of work that is called Immunization Data Evidence for Action, or IDEA, um, which has, was an effort that began in 2017 and wrapped up earlier this year with a focus on really gathering an understanding of what evidence exists around um, the interventions and solutions and efforts that are working to improve the use of data. So next slide. So the IDEA review has, is a global synthesis of the existing evidence um, that is out there that is aimed at increasing the use of high quality data to improve immunization coverage. And the focus we wanted to look at is really to learn and lean into what is working, learn from what is not working, and then be able to invest in filling the knowledge gaps and understand as a global community what evidence do we not have and what we might want to build into research and learning agendas. And so we're going to share about there were three phases of work, so slide four, um, three phases of work. First, we did the evidence gathering. The so next slide, Alex. Um, evidence gathering to understand what evidence is out there. And then we went through a process to synthesize that evidence and think of how to share it and frame it back for key card target audiences and ultimately go through a process of disseminating the actionable findings. Um, and so uh, uh, next slide, slide five, it shows our deep dive overview of really what came out of the review. Um, this is a, it really gives a, a really best look at what evidence exists out there around the use of immunization data. Uh, we, the team reviewed 549 documents uh, based upon a theory of change that was developed um, through a, a larger group effort through a steering committee I'll talk about. And out of that review, 103 pieces of evidence emerged and were plotted in a gap map to show the type of evidence, the type of data use actions that they reflected, um, and the type of intervention. From those, we've pulled out five top findings and written a report. There will also be a forthcoming um, manuscript that's going to be published, and everything has been translated into French, English, and Spanish. So that's sort of a high-level overview, and Alison and I will walk you through the process. We did this 
um, with a variety of partners. The, the, the work was led by um, PATH and PAHO. Uh, team at PAHO was deeply involved throughout the entire, um, the entire time and led by a group of representatives from across the global organizations represented here um, in the steering committee that helped us design the review, design the theory of change, and really think through what would be the best way to present the findings. So representatives from WHO, CDC, UNICEF, Gavi, um, regional efforts at the Afro Office of WHO, learning networks, and even some country um, level participants. So next slide. Um, we intentionally from the beginning with the steering committee, but beyond that even, um, engaged a wide group of stakeholders. We wanted to be sure that what came out of the review would be meaningful and useful for a wide group of people. And so as you can see here, there's a variety of um, groups and bodies that we, in, in, we involved, including SAGE, the Strategic Advisory Group of Experts. Um, there was, is a working group on data uh, for SAGE, and they were involved from the beginning and used the outcomes of the idea review, as you can see in the picture here, um, as part of their presentation and report back to SAGE in April. We also used the work in, um, to support Gavi as they've been developing their own data use strategy um, and, and then also in coordination with many other bodies, such as the WHO regional offices, some work CDC has been doing around reviewing data, country data improvement plans, a variety of EPI managers, um, many of the PAHO country focal points and contacts in different ways, as well as several of the regional networks. Uh, next slide shows how we really focused on connecting this to global norms, um, such as frame, the framework um, and global, the global framework for immunization monitoring and surveillance, and other WHO produced uh, um, pieces of work, such as the classification of digital health interventions, and there recently, the earlier this year. Um, shared WHO guidelines um, on recommendations for digital interventions for health system strengthening. So to make sure that what came out of this review would be able to be very closely linked with these other global norms um, and bodies of work coming out. And so I'm going to pass over to Allison now, if you go to the next slide, Alex, and she's going to really dive into the details of the review itself and the findings that came out of that review. Great. Thanks, Lori, and hello to everyone on the line. Um, so our review was designed to answer two specific research questions uh, that are listed here. So the first question was, what are the most effective interventions to improve immunization data use? And also, what interventions do not work as part of that? And then our second question was about really understanding why do these interventions work? And so many of you, maybe you have or maybe you haven't heard of realist review methodologies, but they're a type of systematic literature review that is becoming a lot more common and frequently used, um, especially in implementation research and um, also especially for studying complex interventions. And so some of the reasons why we chose the realist review methodology um, for the idea review was because first, it's more method methodologically flexible. And so that flexibility allowed us to consider evidence from a broader range of sources um, that included gray literature, uh, such as case studies and m and &E reports. So the kind of literature that we wouldn't traditionally find in a, um, a more traditional systematic review. Um, so that was very appealing to us. And then the screen that you see now uh, was our theory of change. And so after we decided on the methodology, our first step was to develop a theory of change explaining how we expect data use interventions to influence data use. And then this became our guiding framework that we used to direct the literature review and the type of literature that we um, searched for and reviewed. So in, in explaining the theory of change, um, the, the print here is a little small, so I know it's difficult to read, but um, 
starting on the right hand side with the goal and then working backwards, you can see that we, we start with the goal of increasing immunization coverage and equity. And so on the far right side, we identified what we referred to as the data use actions. And these are the ways that we envision healthcare professionals are using immunization data. And so it includes things like facilities using data to track coverage and follow up on unvaccinated. It also includes things like districts using data to track performance or target health facilities for supervision. And so as we reviewed the literature, these were the types of intervention outcomes that we were trying to find evidence of. And many of these actions actually come from the WHO's framework for strengthening immunization and surveillance data for decision making. I'll also point out that we organized these according to different levels of the health system, because we wanted to account for how data is used differently at different levels. So whether you're a facility head nurse or you're a district manager, we wanted to um, consider the different ways that data is being used by um, folks that are playing different roles. And then moving to the middle, we have the intermediate outcomes of data use and we included these because as we were conducting our review, it became apparent that most of those data use um, actions or most of the interventions were not always reporting on these data use actions that we identified, but more commonly we saw they were reporting on things like the intervention's effect on data availability or its effect on whether data was analyzed, synthesized, interpreted, or reviewed. So we realized that this was important to capture and report on some of these intermediary steps that were leading to the data use actions. And then finally, on the left-hand side, we identified a variety of intervention mechanisms and behavior change components. And so we can think of these as some of the key components of data use interventions. And they um, were interventions that um, did things like generate demand for data, improve access and availability of data, or strengthen data quality. And so following the theory, by addressing these mechanisms, we hypothesized that the interventions would produce the intermediary outcomes that then eventually led to improved data use in decision making, and that ultimately that would have a positive impact on immunization coverage and equity. Next slide. So this flowchart shows the number of pieces of literature that we reviewed from the published literature in peer-reviewed journals. Um, and also literature from, from literature. So we conducted two rounds of reviews. During the first round, we only included literature from the immunization field. And then in the second review, we expanded to include evidence from other sectors such as HIV, MNCHN, and that was to help us fill some of the gaps in the immunization literature. So in total, we reviewed over 500 pieces of literature and included 103 articles in our library of evidence. And so I just want to point out in this library of evidence that's shown in the bottom box um, at the bottom of the page, we had two types of evidence. Um, one type was for studies or evaluations that used some sort of scientific research method or evaluation design and we referred to these as evidence. But then we also have this second category that we referred to as promising strategies. And so in that category, we included both gray and published literature that was neither a study nor an evaluation, but we still considered it important to include because um, it was describing an intervention with a strong theoretic likelihood of improving data use 
Um, so even though it had not been evaluated, we thought that there was still important contextual information um, that could be captured from those pieces, um, those promising strategies. Next slide. So then last year, we held a two-day workshop with members of our steering committee and other representatives from the immunization and health data sectors. And during that workshop, we shared our preliminary findings and received input on some of the different implementation considerations. And uh, we discussed how we could tailor the findings for specific target audiences. It also gave us a chance to identify and discuss some of the gaps that we were seeing in the immunization literature. And so it was after that workshop that we went back and conducted a second round of data collection and analysis. And it was during that second round that we expanded outside of immunization to be able to fill some of those gaps. Next slide. So the next step, we took all the literature that we collected and included in our literature library, and we entered the results into um, the evidence gap map that you see here. And it's just a tool that helps us visualize where there's a decent amount of evidence, but also where evidence is lacking. And it's organized according to the different data use interventions that we identified. Those are listed on the left-hand side. And then the fields across the top, they have some of those same intermediate, intermediate outcomes and data use actions that came from our theory of change. And then you see a lot of dots. Um, those dots show where there's evidence. And they're sized according to the amount of evidence. Um, and then the color of the dot also represents the quality of that evidence. So in, in the key down below, it shows um, whether the color corresponds to strong, moderate, or weak level of evidence. And so just by taking a quick glance, you can see there's a lot of evidence for electronic immunization registries and especially around their effect on intermediate outcomes like data availability, data quality. Um, and then there's some evidence, but not as much, on their effect on data use at the facility and district level. But overall, um, when we're looking at this gap map, we can see that there are quite a few empty boxes. And that indicates where we did not find any evidence that the intervention had an effect on the intermediate outcomes or on data use. Um, so actually, we're seeing here quite a few gaps, um, still a lot more work and evidence um, to be produced in this area. Uh, and I just wanted to point out that our, this gap map is posted online. And so um, if you visit the online version, it's interactive and you can place your cursor on the dots and there will be a toolbox that pops up and shows you the specific articles. Um, sometimes there are links to those articles. So it's a really great way to explore the evidence if you're interested in learning about specific interventions or if there's a specific outcome that you want <clears throat> to know more about and know which interventions had a positive effect on that particular outcome. I see there's a question real quick. Does each dot represent one study? So the dots, um, the size of the dot represents the number of studies. So the larger the dot, the more studies. Thank you. Next slide. So we took all the evidence and summarized it into five top findings. If you look at our report, which is also posted online, you'll see that there are many, many findings and lessons from um, the various specific intervention types, but for this presentation, I'll only be discussing these top five findings, which um, were really the key themes that we pooled uh, together from all of the different intervention categories. 
And then also later on in this presentation, Lori will give some specific examples. Um, so next slide, please. <clears throat> the first finding is that interconnected strategies get better results. So we found that multi-component interventions that used a variety of strategies to address data use barriers were the most successful. Um, and so when we talk about multi-component interventions, a good example of this is um, the BID initiative where there's an electronic immunization registry that's the primary intervention component, but then that component is reinforced by a whole suite of other strategies to address the different mechanisms of data use. So for example, it also includes components for strengthening health worker skills and their knowledge about how to use data. It also um, uses peer learning and network platforms like WhatsApp to build demand and motivation for data. So the idea here is that <clears throat> the EIR is not implemented in isolation, but it's rather complemented by these other supportive activities that we know are important for leading to data use. Next slide. And then our second finding is that data use leads to better data. So in fact, we found that there is a dynamic and cyclical relationship between data quality and data use. And the more data is used, the more its quality improves. Um, and so there, we found a lot of investments in interventions specifically focusing on data quality. Um, and that often these interventions assume that if they improve data quality, it will automatically lead to data use. But we actually found very little evidence in the literature uh, to support that assumption. So it's not to say that data quality is not an important barrier. It's um, undoubtedly a barrier to data use, and it's one that features in our theory of change. But our evidence shows that the interventions that were successful at improving data use were also placing equal emphasis on other important mechanisms, such as building the skills, knowledge, structures, and demand for using data. And then <clears throat> the more data is used, the more we were seeing evidence of healthcare workers starting to demand higher quality data. Next slide. Our third finding is that systematizing data use will lead to long-term success. Um, so one thing to point out is that we did not find a lot of studies or evaluations that examined data use interventions over a long period. Um, so this is surely a gap area that still requires more research. However, we did find um, more success among interventions that worked to institutionalize data use and also institutionalize those processes within the health system for using data. And so that included things like ensuring that there are dedicated staff positions for data management, also incorporating data use within existing processes, such as program review meetings. Um, also, another example is ensuring that training curricula and guidelines for health workers include information and expectations on how they should be using data for decision making. And next slide, please. Our fourth finding is that digital systems for capturing routine data, such as HMIS and LMIS, have made higher quality data more available to decision makers and in real time. So our findings um, also show that there's even greater data use when these systems are paired with some of the other complementary activities that reinforce data use, so some of those other activities that we've talked about. Next slide. And finally, we found that although digital systems like HMIS and LMIS show promise, uh, there are still barriers that compromise their effectiveness. Um, so first, we found that the transition from paper to digital systems has not automatically translated into greater data use. 
um, <clears throat> for example, these systems may make the data more available, but that doesn't necessarily mean that data will be used um, in the absence of some of these other complementary activities to build skills and uh, demand. And so, in fact, um, we did see that there has been some more success at the district level and higher um, because of there being fewer operational challenges like electricity, internet connectivity, and human resource capacity. Um, but that in numerous cases, um, investments in these systems have been undermined because they haven't properly taken into account the readiness of the health system. And so this is an area where uh, we've recommended that there really needs to be more of a phased approach that ensures that data use infrastructure and human resources and skill building, that all those pieces are in place before there's a full transition to digital. And so this is just the last slide I have before passing it back to Lori. Uh, in addition to the high level findings that I just went through, another one of our conclusions was that there is a significant lack of rigorously evaluated data use intervention. And many of the evaluations that we did find don't appear to be measuring data use in a systematic way. Um, and so for that reason, we included a section in our report that provides some recommendations for improving monitoring and evaluation of data use interventions. Um, and so it includes some suggestions on ways to improve um, monitoring, primarily through the development of better indicators of data use. That was um, certainly an area that we found lacking. And um, it also includes some suggestions for more appropriate evaluation designs. Um, so things like using process evaluation to really be able to understand and uncover how and why the intervention works. And so these suggestions are meant to help generate more evidence beyond what we found through this review so that we can have a better understanding um, of how to design and carry out the most effective interventions. So with that, I'm going to pass it back to Lori, um, and she'll talk more about our engagement and advocacy. Thanks, Allison. And I will, um, so yeah, just to kind of wrap it up and talk about how we um, have been focusing on sharing these uh, findings and then and then make sure we have time for questions. So as we mentioned earlier, we really went into this entire process at the beginning with thinking who are the audiences who will be most um, interested in and who these findings could be most useful for and really zeroed in on three groups of people, uh, those who are implementing activities to increase data use and to help improve data, uh, policymakers who are making decisions around what types of interventions um, they would implement in their country or they would recommend, and funders who are um, supporting the investment and providing the funding. So as the information, all of the pieces that Allison just highlighted um, were pulled together, we then really thought about what would be most useful in really communicating to those three um, groups of people. And we did so through a variety of communications activities, knowing that different audiences absorb um, information and learnings in different ways. So some people will read the long report, um, but some really want to need probably more um, high level and targeted uh, ways of understanding. So we did with our, our videos, um, such as on the left there, um, different printable materials that can be shared at conferences or, um, you know, shared in, in person. Um, and then we also use social media quite a bit um, when we were first uh, sharing out the findings to be able to um, raise awareness and, and really uh, let people know where to access the, um, the results. So next slide. And now dun, 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 the information is all on TechNet. Um, we had a separate website that was intentionally very temporary 
um, and then have been working closely with the team at TechNet to transition all of the materials to the TechNet site, as you can see at this link here. Um, and and they're, um, the materials are in a variety of, of ways. You can see just the gap, you can see the gap map, you can see the um, theory of change, you can see the entire report, all three languages. Um, and then we've also broken out the findings, uh, again, by those groups and in very digestible, easy ways. There are checklists, um, that can be used to, as, as someone is thinking about selecting an intervention, uh, the monitoring and evaluation pieces that Allison was just talking about. So as you browse through, you can see that there's um, a variety of ways of um, sharing about these findings and learning about them as well. Uh, and next slide. I think this might. Okay. Um, and so then just thinking about, you know, ways that you can access it, you can find the information on the TechNet site um, and be thinking about what, we, what we've encouraged people all along to figure out what are the data use challenges that you experience um, in your work and how would the findings that came out of this review apply and how could they be useful to you um, and, and to then share. Um, so we've, with the social media work, use the hashtag find your finding um, and really encouraging people to share this information with others. It's, um, it is only as good as, as it is used. And so we have been very excited to share that. And with that, I think we can um, close. You can just stay on this slide, Alex, so people can see the, um, the URL and we can take questions. Thank you very much. So, um, is there any question? No question? Actually, it looks like there's one question that just came in. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, do you have any? Yes, yeah. people had to, had to warm up and think about questions. Um, so, do you have any work that links the surveillance data to immunization data? That's a great question, and, and Allison can correct me if I'm wrong. We focused, um, we did not, I believe the surveillance data was um, excluded in the study. That's right, isn't that right, Allison? That we were focusing? That is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so more on the routine data. So again, that would be another very interesting piece of research to look at um, the use of surveillance um, data. And then the next question is, what are real constraints for the limited data use in immunization? Well, I think Allison highlighted uh, quite a few in her um, in the in her information. I think um, the just thinking of our key findings that came out. I think a lot of it, you know, there is certainly some to um, not having in, an approach in the implementation that includes a focus on data use. That was where the, you know, the multi-pronged approach showed more evidence of increasing data use because, you know, it's more than just improving a tool or improving a system or process, but also building um, in the, the pieces around it to support data use. I think there were um, aspects around how do you systematize that if it's not systematized um, into, you know, the staffing and into the staff capacity and into the way data are used in meetings, that can also be a barrier or a constraint. Um, obviously, there's certain things around, um, yeah, just sort of infrastructure pieces that can also play a role. Alice, would you add, are there other constraints that you want to highlight? That, that covers it. Um, I don't think I'm seeing the same questions that you're seeing. <laughs> oh. Yeah, there, there are some. Uh, yeah, because the, the some people ask questions on the Q and A's, and uh, there's a question on the chat from Kevin. That's the question I see. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Can, can you go ahead, Alison, with the question? Sure. I I can respond to the question on the chat. Um, thank you, Kevin. So the the question is. Um, uh, the, the point about improving data use, having a positive impact on data quality, it makes sense, it fits with other sectors. The question is, um, so we often focus on data quality at lower levels, but data use at higher, higher levels, what is the impact 
does data use at the higher level of the health system have any impact on data quality from lower levels? Um, on, on this point, I, I think what we what we were seeing in our evidence that we reviewed is that um, although there may be data use happening, data analysis at higher levels of the health system where there's greater capacity for that, it may not be trickling down or there are um, a lack of feedback loops where the higher levels of the health system are helping the lower levels of the health system in interpreting their data, but also correcting it when there are quality issues. And so I think that that was the piece that was coming out through the evidence we found of the connection between the two levels and the need for stronger feedback loops for um, supportive supervision to ensure that um, the knowledge and skills from higher levels is trickling down um, and then feeding back up. And I see a couple more in the Q&A. Um, so one, how do national immunization programs secure EIR data adequately for countries in Sub-Saharan Africa? Um, so that that is a very big question. <laughs> um, I think that it really depends on, and this, that's a bit beyond the scope of this review, because this review was looking at the use of data, um, no matter how they are um, are being used. Um, and so I, I guess the question um, can be taken both ways: is it how to make sure it's secure, and also maybe how it's available. Um, so again, I think it depends on the, the context and the country's policies and infrastructure and where they're at. So that, that probably merits its own webinar. That's a big question. Um, then the, the next question is survey immunization data is considered more valid and used, but routine coverage data has not, doesn't have as much reliability. Um, is reliability a related reason why data use is so limited? I'm not sure that emerged in the in the review itself, did it, Allison? I think that is definitely um, a theory that that without due to lack of trust in the data, it may be used less. Did that emerge in the review? Sure yeah, um, I, I I must say I don't think we had as much evidence on this specific area, um, but I would agree that that does factor into our theories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that would be another area that would be very interesting to research more. Um, but I, I mean, I think, I think that's a very, probably a very plausible <laughs> theory that um, as trust is built, there would be, you know, increased use. Um, but that would be interesting to study. Um, another question, does electronic immunization registry capturing live vaccination data have more accuracy in comparison to any other data monitoring system. Is that true? I actually think that is still being studied. I'm not, I, I um, you know, even based on the immunization registry work that we do at PATH, which is separate from this review, um, that that's something that a lot, a lot of people are still studying. I think it, you know, no matter how data are captured, uh, be it electronic, on paper, there's always a need to ensure that it's of high quality. Um, and, and accurate. So I think just because it's electronic doesn't guarantee that. There are some ability to build into systems to um, ensure that it, you know, there's, there are, um, you know, it has to be complete. It has to, you know, there's even you know, things that have to be filled in that, that they can't do. But I think, I think there's a lot of studies looking at that very question right now. So that'll be interesting to see what comes out of those. Great. Any other question? Um, the, the data quality is a major challenge in Kenya due to the number of tools used by healthcare providers and the shortages experienced of HCPs. Investing in EIR would help sort out the problem. However, poor, poor infrastructure and poor prioritization are a major hindrance. Is there an innovation that could be used to solve the problem? That is also a, a big, <laughs> a big question. Um, there are more and more, and again, this is outside of this this review. Since idea was focusing on any intervention, 
um, that's improving the use of data. So, you know, quality is a factor to use, as Allison was sharing. Um, but uh, yeah, I think there's there are a variety of ways and, and tools that are emerging and as technology improves um, to be able to do that. And I know actually um, we've had conversations with the Kenya EPI team to think about that um, ourselves. I'm sure they're talking with many others. So sounds like Alice, you could have an EIR webinar. Um, there'd be a lot of interest. We'd be happy to help with that. Okay, excellent. Good to hear. Um, yeah. There's another question from Hosam. Uh, did m and &E help to improve data quality in the lower level? I'm not sure, Alison, that jump in on that. Yeah, one. go ahead. Um, so I, I would categorize this a bit in the supportive supervision category. Um, and it, it, it goes along with um, thinking about the, the structures um, and um, supervision processes that are in place for uh, national down to district levels, being able to provide um, supervision to the facilities and helping them with correcting errors in data quality, um, but also helping that build their skills to use the data. So in that sense, um, if we're thinking of m and &E from the perspective of, say, supportive supervision, um, that definitely was an area that we showed um, evidence of it helping to improve quality and data use. Thanks. Um, maybe do you have anything else to complete or some uh, question, the latest one? The last one, do you have a specific tool for m and &E at all levels that can be used at all levels in the country? Yeah, so in the report, we did insert um, a chapter on recommendations for monitoring and evaluation. And so um, uh, based on the literature we were reviewing, we made some recommendations about potential indicators that could be used. Um, so I, I would suggest um, taking a closer look at that section of the report. Excellent. Any other question? Um, a yes, maybe one in the chat. Let me see. Some countries are willing to have data analysts instead of data manager at central level. Did you find any insight related to this? Uh, data analysts versus data managers. You know, we did not, um, there's, it's not ringing any bells. I don't think we found anything that specifically got into the distinction between those two roles. Thank you. So we have another five minutes if you want to have any, to ask other questions. Anyone? Oh, there's another question. Well, you see, it's uh, <laughs> so is there any option to ask questions live audio call? Um, yes, Mohammed, would you, you would like to, to ask a question? Um, uh, okay, Hossam is saying that it's a very uh, it's a very helpful pre presentation. Thank you, Hossam. So, Mohamed, um, yes, it's possible to uh, to ask a question live. Would you like um, to Would you like to to speak? Okay, Mohamed, I Mohamed, we can we can, listen, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Thank you very much for providing me this opportunity. Although I understand there is only four minutes left, but actually I want to introduce Pakistan. Pakistan is facing real challenges regarding the low coverage inequities in immunization. But the real problem is related to the data is less reliability of immunization data. And they have more reliability on the survey data. Main reason we found and discussed with our managers in the districts as well as in the province we found that uh, the data inaccuracies over reporting is a major problem which uh, which limits their trust on the use of the immunization data so the one pro solution they think is just to build up the capacity but not just the capacity but also the accountability of those who just exaggerate and put uh, exaggerated figures instead of the real figures as far as the immunization data is concerned at the health facility but another thing they are considering is improvement in the monitoring immunization system. 
maybe we we are thinking to have one uniform system across the country which is epi mis for immunization and it also I mean has the component of electronic immunization uh, whereby we just record the real time immunization data capture the photograph of the child who is being uh, immunized and the live live data which is mean from the vaccination point up till the next level district province and the national level so that would probably reduce the inaccuracies and build up the trust of the managers to use the immunization data in a better way thank you very much thank you mohammed uh, alison laurie anything you would like to say about it um, no, I mean, I think that's not an uncommon mm -hmm. <laughs> situation. And I think, yeah, this is, this is partly why, um, and maybe as a, as a closing comment too, is, um, when we came together with PAHO to look at doing this review, this was, that was really the hope behind it was to understand together, um, and have a, a body of evidence that everyone could access to understand what is working and what isn't working and also what else what other research do we need to do um, to be able to really make wise investments in ways to improve the use of, of immunization data? And so that I think that's a great case study of, of, of work they're doing to, to also understand the same thing and was really a lot of the thinking behind um, doing, doing the IDA work in the first place. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for attending this uh, this webinar. Thank you, Alison and Laurie. It was very interesting, and I think some of our uh, some of our attendees are really happy about it and mentioned it. Um, as I said earlier, we're going to post uh, the presentation with the video that I'm going to edit so that you have a, you can see better the the, the presentation on it. And uh, yes, if you have further questions, you'll be able to ask those questions on this uh, on the forum post that will be posted probably by Monday, the time for me to edit the, the video. Alison, Laurie, thank you very much. Um, I wish you a good day because uh, you're just starting. It's very, very early uh, for you. It's like uh, 7 o'clock in the morning now. So thank you very much for starting this, uh, for, for participating to this webinar so early. And um, good. Uh, have a good day, evening, uh, everybody. Thank, thank you, Alex. Bye-bye.